So with extremists not playing by any of the rules, and I'm throwing these up just to give you references that exist, the Russians were going to play by the rules. We knew what their ethos was, but extremists don't play by any of the rules. And terrorists play by none of these rules, law of armed conflict, humanitarian law. So if you, don't, if you have that side not playing by the rules, how do you then keep your playing by the rules? The corporal is standing protecting his own, and there's a girl coming, running at them 200 meters away, and she, look at it, she looks pregnant, you know, she's dressed up. Is she a pregnant girl seeking a place secure, or is she a suicide bomber? If he thinks because of what's been going on, she's a suicide bomber, and shoots her, and she is a pregnant girl that's been seeking, how do you handle the work that you're supposed to do to help reconcile, the, you know, we're here to help you, you know, and, 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 and all the traumas that that causes on the individual, but on the mission. But what if he doesn't shoot her, and she is a suicide bomber, and she runs in, and she's remotely blown up and kills a bunch of his buddies and a bunch of civilians you're supposed to be protecting? What happens then? How do you handle that, the aftermath? My mission three weeks within it when the force was being pulled out, the Secretary General of the UN sent me an order to pull out. It was a legal order, and I refused it three times. The order was legal because we were being told that we were about to be wiped out by the extremists. But the order was immoral because we had over 30,000 Rwandans under our protection and we had seen what one small force had pulled out and 4,000 been slaughtered in a matter of hours. So those 30,000 would have been slaughtered, no questions asked. So we faced these dilemmas where things might be legal, but they're immoral. So what do you handle? Do you handle the court-martial because you disobeyed that order? Or do you, do you obey the order and not be able to live with yourself because those 30,000 deaths are on your hands. And that's the situation in which we find ourselves where all the old tools of the past are not working. They're not as simple as that. They're not, they're not uh, the uh, doctrine that's going to meet these difficult challenges. And because of that, these moral and legal and ethical dilemmas are going to continue to abound and they will create more and more and more traumas. And so more and more injuries of the psychological nature in which individuals will come back significantly affected uh, by uh, what they have experienced and how they have lived uh, those and decided within those contexts. And so I'm going to move rapidly to the scientific side of my presentation. And this is my science. This is an example of a career during the Cold War. Uh, where, you know, there's a stress level over the years where the, in the middle, you know, the family is moving, the, the kids are now teenagers, they don't want to move, the spouse has got a job and so on. But in the end, all in all, it's been an interesting career. It's been interesting experience, they've lived, they've traveled and so on, and it's a good, a good and reasonable life. This is what's going on now. That they're going from one incredibly complex mission to another repeatedly. And there is no instrument to bring them down. So as an example here, after that first mission, when they came back home, we didn't bring them down to a level where the family and the individual has sort of grown from that experience and stabilized the, le the stress levels and people have been able to exchange and to establish a certain level of comfort, we simply let them come home and hopefully things will work out. And then within too short a period of time, bingo, they're sent off again. Or they're warned that they're being sent off again into these complex missions. And so both the individual and the family are sent back on this exponential curve of stress that is built upon the first one, and so on. And so it is no surprise that we have families breaking up, that we've got families insisting that people 
pulled out of the forces, even though they got experience and, and they want to stay in. We've got wife beatings, child beatings, we've got drugs, we've got uh, booze, we've got pornography, we've got people thrown in jail, we've got rubby dubs, people in, and then you know, completely disconnecting from society, street turning into street people, and we've got people killing themselves. Because there has been no means of bringing this thing down to maybe that level where with not only time, but with a process in which the individual and the family, and the family can be a single person's parents. That's part of the family. That's a whole new dimension. The children, teenagers in particular, and how they adjust to this. And how long term can you do this? An example I was talking to the professor is a very close one that's happened to me very recently. When I in, was in Rwanda, the Canadian Army sent me 12 officers to flush out the headquarters because everybody else had been pulling out. Out of the 12, nine of them have crashed totally and have been trying to rebuild their lives uh, since then. I, in the year 1998, totally crashed. I was a three-star general. Uh, I'd come back from work, and the chief of defense staff, or your chairman of joint chiefs, called me up and said, said, how are you doing? Well, I said, I'm doing pretty good. I had been testifying in front of the International Tribunal for the Rwandan genocide. I'd come back. Uh, I was the head of all personnel for all the, the forces, 140-odd thousand people, uh, and I was a little tired. And he said, why don't you take a month off? He had seen that I wasn't operating on all pistons. And when he said that, that broke. So I cried for about 24 hours, and then it took seven months before I was even able to pick up a newspaper, let alone be able to read it. Be able to focus, to be able to concentrate. And all the therapy, weekly, and the medications all they did was try to stabilize in order to do that. And then went back slowly uh, to work. And now I am in my 13th year of therapy. And I am in. Because what I did is I looked at Woody Allen. And I looked at Woody Allen movies. And Woody Allen movies in the 60s, when you lived in New York, it was in to have a psychiatrist and a psychologist. If you didn't have one, you were out. And you discussed. You know, mine did this, and mine does this method, and so on. Well, I think it's in. I consider it in to have therapists. I take nine pills a day. The ones during the day are trying to keep that sort of rhythm. And the ones at night are to block out all the horrors and to knock me out so I can sleep. Because without sleep, then you self-destruct. And the example I like to use is the example when I went down to the Marine Corps Staff College three years ago because they were seeing a whole bunch of their officers crashing. They weren't able to sustain the pressures of the studies and so on, which is a sort of master's level program. And they were trying to figure out what was going on. And I described to them uh, one of the sort of uh, thematics that come about from those who are affected by this, particularly uh, in the officer corps and so on. What it is, is uh, you try to commit suicide, which I was unsuccessful four times, only because there was too many people around me. And what you then try to do is you try to work yourself to death. So what you do is you work all the time. So I had made a clone of my office in my apartment. And so I went from the office to my apartment and kept working. I'd never go to my bedroom because I couldn't stand the noise of the silence. It was, it was fearful at night. So I worked until I passed out and did that for months and months. And then all of a sudden one day, my body turned itself off. They brought me to the emergency at the hospital and they thought I was having a heart attack. And they went through me, every orifice and angle and God knows what they did. And they found nothing, except this psychiatrist came in and said, you know what? 
He said, your body decided to close down. It couldn't handle it anymore. And so the whole metabolism was simply closing down. And so I was succeeding in committing suicide by working myself to death. And I was lucky enough to be able to get enough therapy brought back in to bring me back uh, to a level. And so it has a whole series of different angles to it. And one of the things, and very rapidly I'll bring it because I want time for questions, is the following. One thing that the institutions have got to do is stop treating people like resources or like trucks. And the military is a fine example of that. We want 100% perfection and, and operations, and if you don't give that, then you're, you're, you're not working well, and so we'll put you aside, we'll throw you out, uh, and we'll build policies as if we're building them from engineering. You know, we got a truck, it's good for 20 years. After that, we get rid of it and we put a new truck in. You can't run people like machines. People have got to be run as individuals. Every one of them. I commanded 12,000 troops. Every one of them had a family. Every one of them had a personal life. It wasn't a way of operating saying, geez, you know, I've, I've achieved 95% effectiveness with my troops. That is a fail marking. It's excellent if you're buying a gun or a truck. 95% operational effectiveness, hey, that's excellent. But with human beings, nothing below 100% is good. Because every one of them counts. And so change the nature of the institution that says it's built on people, and people are our best and most important resource, well then hold them accountable to do that, even when they're not working on all pistons, and particularly those who surround them. So you end up with this, uh, injured personnel. Those who feel and seem to have a grip on the situation have been affected but, but are able to work with it, and are trying to mentor those who are non-veterans and what can happen, and the fact that they can be actually injured psychologically. One of the great frictions of this time is you've got veterans and non-veterans serving. And so the non-veterans are very intolerant to the veterans who have psychological problems because they, first they can't see it, and secondly they'll say, well, what, what a bunch of wimps wouldn't happen to me. But what happens when some of your best soldiers are the ones who are the most psychologically damaged? And injured. And so some of these are crucial, but how many missions can they handle? Four? Five? Six? We have people in uniform now who've got more combat time and more complex combat time than World War II veterans. Yet the system hasn't really recognized that. The people haven't recognized that. That these are of combat nature of complexity and scale. The second group are the ones who, are, of course, react and are overt and, and have all kinds of expressions of lost their sense of humor, uh, and they, they, their personality is up and down, uh, they go to extremes and create problems and so on, and those that, uh, well, you can see them. And, and uh, too often uh, we see them too late, and too often we'll, we'll consider them problem children before we realize it's the injury, and we'll throw them out and we'll leave them in in the hands of uh, the population, and ultimately they're abandoned. And then there's the other ones, which brings me back to those officers sitting in the corner of the snake pit, who simply s try to hide between the paint and the wall. They try to camouflage it. And the next thing you know, they're hanging in the basement. And so those are elements of what's out there. And so the quandary that is within those who are injured is, is this injury honorable? That's the first point. Is it honorable to have this injury? Losing an arm is honorable, but losing some of the gray cells between your ears, is that honorable? And can you be treated and recognized as that being an honorable injury? And so the cultural shift is one of the first ones. The other elements are, are signs that, that you can identify in the individual 
uh, and there's a listing here, and I don't want to spend too much time on that, but simply articulating, and I think uh, it's my next slide, uh, is the old theories don't work. And that's the first step. The old theory, when I came back in 1994, the seniors told me, listen, Romeo, don't worry about it. You know, with hard work and time, it'll all make its way. That is bullshit. It is absolutely, totally wrong. Because the Rwandan genocide for me happened this morning. The Holocaust for the Holocaust survivor happened this morning. And it needs next to nothing to trigger it. And let me give you an example. There's the 11th of November is coming up. We wear the poppy in Canada for, for the campaign in the First World War. And so you will have this sort of pimply, sort of uh, young journalist, sort of with a microphone, and ram it in the face of this octogenarian veteran of, of uh, Normandy, right? D-Day. And, and he'll say, gee, sir, he said, what was it like on the beach that day? And so the Octo General will start talking. And within a minute, at most, he'll have a hard time pronouncing. And, and he'll be choked up in his eyes. And so the reaction is, is oh my, you know, he's, he's, he, the memories are coming back. No, it's not the memories are coming back. That octogenarian, that veteran, is back on the beach. He's reliving the fear that he soiled his pants, that the brains of his buddy are spread all over him, and that the bullets are flying, and he's not too sure he's going to make it any farther. He's reliving it. And that's what's with this injury, is that it doesn't go away. So how do you attenuate it? How do you work on it? Well, professional help is absolutely crucial. Peer support is fundamental. I don't know which one is which, but anyways, the two of them are needed. Professional help to try to work you through the technical aspect, both the, the psychiatrist and the psychologist, the medication. My medication to me is no different than somebody who's got diabetes. I've accepted that if I don't take those pills, you don't want to see me. The, the human being that is without that medication is not a human being people want to know. Nor do I really want to live with that. So I've accepted that the medication is going to keep me reasonable so I can keep on doing a reasonable job. And there are frictions between the therapists that don't help the, 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 the patients. The frictions between the psychiatrist and the psychologist is a horrific friction. Which one really leads and which one is the, the aim and, and where do we go with the, the, the emphasis of the support we do with therapists. And one of the examples I like using is the following. You got a person who comes, you got a hot plate on the stove and slams his hand on the hot plate, burns his hand. The psychiatrist is going to look at that and is going to say, now how do I reduce the pain and how do I reestablish you know, a normalcy within that hand as best as possible and work with the individual to do that? The psychiatrist is going to say, why did you put your hand there in the first place? So the long term care is where? Is with both of them working in tandem, but in support one of the other and not in friction. And so too often, the individuals, the, the clients, the soldier is caught between these two. And as an example, in our army, our psychiatrists run the show and the psychologists have no power. And so we're fighting to bring that to equilibrium. The peer support is crucial. Between those formal sessions, you need somebody who can be at the end of a phone, a bosom buddy. Usually it's not family because they're too close. They ask too many stupid questions. And so you just need somebody who will sit there for four hours and listen to you talk. And talk and talk and cry with you a bit, laugh with you, and be there. And so we created in Canada a whole series of veterans, new generation veterans who've been affected and who are uh, stabilized, who are peer support to these people. And I was at ICT uh, uh, talking with them, 
And the example, I'll, I'll, I'll pull it out here, is they show me an example of where they, they're going to have on the web uh, the surrogate sort of uh, people who can talk to you. So you, because one of the first problems is, do you want to go to a therapist? So what I did when I was the, the, the three star, is I went to all our therapists and I told them, I said, hey, first thing is, is it's an injury, right? Not a disease, not mental health. Don't want to hear that professional word out of the lexicon. Operational stress injury. Second thing is, your job is to sell your product. They have to volunteer to come to you, but they're afraid of you. So you've got to go and meet them. You've got to go in the field. You've got to go in the operational theaters. You've got to go and talk to them. You've got to learn their lingo and build that link. And then they'll come to you. So that was the, the, second, the second element uh, that was critical. And then the third element was, of course, that peer support, that sort of intermediary entity to help and stabilize throughout. And so um, the family and the individual are a package. No matter how much help we give to the individual, if we do not provide support to the family, you will never achieve your aim. It could be 40% curing or 50%, but you will never bring the individual back to an operational level that you really want, or as close as you can, and sustaining uh, the effort with the family. And so the family has got to be brought in to the exercise, the two, and teenagers in particular. And the case I show is one of my officers out of the nine who crashed, one of them committed suicide three years ago, 14 years after. And he, there were stresses in the family, of course, because the individual has been closing himself in in his work and not cooperating and, and difficult uh, with the family. And so his wife got mad at him that evening, and she went and slept with the daughters because they were all upset, and the whole family's upset and so on. So she, she thought she'd calm them down. Next morning when she woke up, she found him hanging in the bathroom. So we have bereavement programs, right, for, uh, in Canada for a year, helping them out and so on. So it's been three years. On the anniversary of the third year, these daughters are now teenagers. And they turn to their mother and they accuse her of having triggered his suicide by having argued with him. If we care for the veteran throughout his life, injured or not, then do we not also have a responsibility of caring for when the, the soldier is killed or commits suicide to the family for the rest of their lives? I mean, that's what they're living. And if they are able to sort themselves out, fine. But if not, that is a lifelong exercise. And so lastly, um, you've got to create the environment you got to identify the problem early, so both in the field and as early as possible because that's your best uh, opportunity to intervene. Uh, you've got to create uh, an atmosphere that will provide that support uh, and ultimately uh, ensure the continuity of it through the peer support program. And I would simply like to indicate uh, that those who are psychologically affected with operational stress injury have got to build their prosthesis also. They gotta know what conversations to avoid. They gotta know what places to go, not to go to. I do never, I, I have never returned to a market or a grocery store since the first one I came back in, after Rwanda. Because the opulence of the odor of all those fruits and fresh vegetables was such that it completely overwhelmed me and all I did was I saw the distribution points where people were killing each other to try to get food and the, and the, the marketplaces where they were selling rotten bananas and avocados. And so I cannot go to a grocery store, still today. I am a grandfather of just over a year. My granddaughter is about eight months, last Easter. And she's walking around in the family, in the house, and she falls down and hits her head. 
and the whole place goes nuts. Eh? Boom, oh gee, what's the injured and, and injured and so on. I don't move. Because in the nanoseconds that she cried and injured, and the reaction of the family, what I had was a teleprompter. And the thousands of babies that I saw chopped up and slaughtered all came back. And so I had to go into an increased session of therapy and medication in order to be able to even enjoy the presence of my granddaughter. So we got to build that prosthesis. But the terrible thing about it is that that prosthesis is not yours to control. Sometimes somebody takes it away. When you have a physical one, you can choose when to put it on or off. But with a psychological one, there are some circumstances where it completely takes away. I put him up there because the last time I visited the White House, we can still see his fingernails on the floor of the <laughs> Oval Room. I end with this anecdote. In 2001, I was in Sierra Leone demobilizing child soldiers. And I had been in the field for a while and then come back to Freetown to discuss with a bunch of NGOs what we were doing with them. As I'm crossing the street, I notice from an angle a vendor, and he's selling coconuts, and he's got a machete. And as I'm continuing to walking, I still see him, and I see him take the machete and top off the top of, a, of the coconut, and the white is seen, and the liquid, and the sound. And I went totally and completely berserk. And I tried to kill the guy. And the people who were with me, it took over six minutes for them, three of them, to hold me down. Fifteen minutes later, I was stabilized enough and I went to the meeting. There are times when that prosthesis just ain't there. And we don't know when it's going to take off. So we don't know if we're going to live two years or two months or two weeks that a circumstance will make it that you might go to the extreme of this injury and use the terminal phase of it. Thank you very much. So, is there time for questions? I'd be happy to answer. I put that one up because <laughs> while I was in, in Rwanda, I asked to be relieved of my command because I lost my sense of awe. I lost my sense of humor. And that's the first sign of the commander. If you can't convincingly talk to your people and say good morning and respond to them, and then you know that yourself is not able to sustain this. So if you don't have a sense of humor, don't become a command. But you can build that. So any questions? Yes, ma'am. Is there anything that can be done in terms of prevention? Yes. Uh, in prevention, um, uh, there is um, a lot of work being done on blast and the impact of blast and uh, how to give better protection against blast because a blast does lead to, to depression and can lead to PTSD, so blast injuries. Um, we are also uh, more and more programs of uh, educating on what they uh, can see as the injury uh, when they are put in different circumstances. So one is better training on the difficult, ambiguous uh, missions they're doing and how to handle these ethical, moral, and legal dilemmas. But the other side of it is seeing the impact that it can have on you, the guilt you can live, the, the problems of, of sustaining that. So educating them before they go. Secondly, in the field, you need the professional therapist there to help them, and you've got to train people within your organization to recognize those who are being injured and immediately respond, pull them out, and help them out. In the case in Rwanda, uh, when I, uh, there was one as an example, one officer came to the orders group in the morning and he had his full combat webbing on inside the headquarters. It looked a little weird. 
we had been uh, under uh, shelling a number of times and so on. So he was there, he had his flashlight on, it was seven o'clock in the morning and everything. That evening when he came back with all his equipment still on, I pulled him out and sent him for 24 hours out of the theater into Nairobi to sleep in clean sheets, have a meal, not hear the sound, not the smell of the decaying bodies and so on, just completely rest. He came back and he was responsive. Others took three days and others we didn't take back. I had uh, three soldiers who were caught up in a church uh, that they were defending, they were overwhelmed, they were held at gunpoint as the militia slaughtered just over a thousand people by machete in that church over three days. Those three never came back. So yeah, you can do a lot of preventive stuff, but uh, the, the post exercise is the most critical. One, a transition phase from the theater of operations to home. No matter how much they want to get home, don't let them go home. Create a and so we created a transition base for those in Afghanistan and in Cyprus where we keep them five days, six days, and they're, they're monitored as best we can. Uh, we try to avoid them getting pissed at the gills every night, uh, but they're in clean sheets, they're talking, they're meeting with therapists, uh, with professionals, they're being assessed at their state of mind, so on. Uh, and so they have that sort of transitory time frame to sort of come down from that high adrenaline level to a level that is uh, reasonable. And then we send them home. And then we monitor them for the first three months. They are reviewed a couple times during that time, every soldier. And then if there's any signs, then we uh, put them into the program. But there's just not enough therapists to handle it. 